Now it's my turn to be muted. Hi, everybody. Good to be here with you. Um, it's it's going to be fun, I hope. So why don't we just get right into it? Oops, I don't want to share my screen. So I, I always joke that my, uh, so you can see my screen now, right? Okay. I always joke that my interest is fluid mechanics because I'm, a, I'm obsessed with swimming. I, I do it, I swim every day. Um, I used to swim in the NYU pool before it closed. It's like the best, one of the best pools in the city. Um, so maybe after this is over, I'll see some of you there. But so I, I always joke about that. And so my research is about the math of the cell, but specifically what I do is about fluid mechanics mm -hmm. of the cell. So I'm just gonna start by introducing a couple projects that I've worked on just to kind of tease your interest. And then I'll talk about exactly how I'm going to uh, give the seminar around those topics. So for some of you, this might be, you might know what happens today. Uh, for others of you, it might be new. So we'll talk about it. And please absolutely let me know. I've seen this before, this is boring, speed up or slow down. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So the first thing that I started with actually as an undergrad was modeling the surface of the cell. So cells, I don't, I can't figure out where I put the zoom. I'll just minimize it. Uh, so cells are made, they make these protrusions called blebs to migrate. So what you can see here in this video is the formation of a bleb. So here's a cell, it opens up this kind of pore in here. And what happens is that there's a, pre, there's a kind of pressure release. So the cell is pressurized and then when that pore opens up, fluid rushes in to fill that pore. And it can, if the cell does it repeatedly, it results in a migration of the cell. So part of what I did was I developed an, a new numerical method for simulating the cell and the bleb specifically. So here is a simulation that we did of the bleb forming. And what you see that definitely stands out is that this bleb here is, no, is not as smooth as this one here. So part of the problem with the numerical method that we made was that the bleb becomes smoother than it actually is. So we realized that this numerical method was not very good to apply to things with, oops, things with non-smooth shapes. So we tried a smooth shape, which is a red blood cell flowing in a channel. And what you can see is that we were able to kind of qualitatively reproduce with this red blood cell in the channel, the actual shapes you get in experiments. And the reason is that the channel is what we call no slip surface, which means that the velocity here is zero. The fluid can't move. So imagine you're pushing a cell through a channel, a capillary, and the side is kind of stuck, but the front wants to move forward. So this initial biconcave shape gets expanded out in the front, but on the sides, it stays kind of flat. And so you get this parachute-like shape. So another thing that I've looked at is how the cell moves. So the cell can undergo a number of it has a number of ways that it moves, but in three dimensions, it moves through something called the extracellular matrix. And what the extracellular matrix is, is basically a bunch of fibers that are stacked on top of each other and side by side. So there's a big array of these fibers. So what we did was we took a 2D cut of that matrix. And so we get these blue dots and that represents the fibers. And then we took a 2D cut of the cell and then the pink, the, the green is gonna be like the membrane and the pink is gonna be like the inside of the cell, the nucleus kind of, if the cell had a big nucleus. And what we did was we simulated it moving and it, there was two different things that we simulated. One is when the, there's a protrusion in the front and cells make those using actin. So they make these protrusions that you can see here. If I jump ahead a little bit, oops. 
there's a protrusion and it binds to one of the extracellular nodes. And because the extracellular matrix is elastic, the cell gets stuck to this node and then the elasticity of the cell pulls the back forward. And the one thing that you see in this video is that when the cell tries to move here, it gets stuck for a little bit around these nodes. And that's because these nodes want to go back to their original positions, they're elastic. And so the cell can't just move away because there's fluid there. The fluid sticks the cell to the nodes and prevents it from moving as fast. Another thing we simulated is this rear squeezing mechanism of motion. So we took a cell and instead of having one protrusion, we did two protrusions where now the cell squeezes forward from the back, like you just saw there, boom. So it makes two protrusions, it binds two nodes, and then it squeezes forward from the back. And what you see is that kind of looks like, I mean, very vaguely, like this experimental video. You see that backward squeeze where the cell is kind of pushing itself forward in the rear. And what we did in this paper was we analyzed when these different regimes are successful, when they fail, and when the cell might prefer one over the other. So what I've been working on now is the inside of the cell. So I've been working on trying to understand the structure of what we call the cytoskeleton. And here's a nice, uh, this is just from Wikipedia. This is a nice microscopic image, fluorescence microscopy image of the cell. And what you see is that the cell is really filled with all these, these green and red things. And the green are, are what we call microtubules which you've probably heard of, and the red are these actin filaments, which are less well known. And what you see is that the actin, while it is inside the cell, it's very much clustered on the membrane. So the actin is really responsible for the cell dividing. Those proteins are key in cell division. So we wanted to, the real goal of this project is to understand how the cell arranges these fibers to divide and also to make these actin protrusions. And so we start started studying that by just looking at the mechanical properties of the fibers. So one way you can study mechanical properties is you take a bunch of fibers, you put them in a box, and then you shake the box back and forth. So what you're doing is you're applying a strain. And when you shake the box back and forth, there's a certain stress that develops in the suspension. And the relationship between the stress and the strain gives you ideas about the properties of the material. So it tells you, for example, think about a rubber band, right? When you pull on a rubber band, the stress is proportional to the strain. The more you strain it, the more stress the rubber band gets. That's called an elastic solid. But something that's viscous, the stress, like think about a fluid. If you just try to pull water, what matters is not how much you've pulled the water, but how fast you're trying to pull it. And so that means that the stress is proportional to the rate of strain. And so that's the difference between what we call a viscous material like water and an elastic material like a rubber band. And we took these fibers and we cross-linked them using these black linkers. And we looked at, when we shook it back and forth, we looked at the elastic and viscous properties of the suspension. Okay, so that's kind of what I've done so far. And the common pieces of this, which is what the seminar is going to focus on, are computational fluid dynamics. So the one thing that I work on is, well, one thing I use is I make numerical solvers for these fluid equations in the presence of the structures. So in order to understand how to do this, we're going to look at, first of all, we're going to look at basic but practical numerical methods to solve fluid equations. So things like today, we're gonna to talk about a spectral method to solve fluid equations. And then next time we're going to derive and discuss the equations that we wanna solve. So those equations are called the Navier-Stokes equations. But when you look at a cell, a cell is really tiny. And so those equations actually simplify quite a lot. And I'll discuss that next time. And then we're gonna build numerical solvers for the equations. So we'll work together to write a MATLAB code that will solve fluid equations and get fluid velocities. And then we'll learn how to account and program for the presence of structures. So the end goal of this class, of this seminar, 
is to have a code that will simulate something like this. This is an ellipse here. It's kind of like a stretch, stretched out rubber band. Oops, sorry. And if I hit play, what happens, what's going to happen is it's going to relax to its reference circular shape. And what you see is you're looking at the horizontal fluid velocity. So the, the, this, these colors are the fluid. So here the fluid is going backwards and here the fluid is going forwards with the membrane. So there's a kind of feedback that happens where the cell is stretched out, it exerts a stress on the fluid as it wants to go back to its reference shape. The fluid moves and it takes the cell with it. Okay, so that's all for my intro slides. Does anybody have any questions? Was that interesting, not interesting? What, what did you find uh, most interesting or most boring? Most people are bored with the inside of the cell, the cytoskeleton. They, they don't think it's a sexy research topic. But. Zan, you've seen some of that stuff, right? A lot of it? Yeah. Um, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, so what is the driving force for the cells to make those protrusions? And yeah, usually, just... yeah, usually what they're doing is they're polymerizing actin. So I'll draw you a picture on my iPad once I get it up here. So usually what happens is that the cell will have a, a mem, you know, it'll be in a circular shape. And then here's some fibers here, right? And then what happens is there's polymerization of the fibers. So they start growing. And when they start growing, they push against this membrane. And then the membrane expands and you get these protrusions. So we, we didn't, when we did it, we didn't account for the fibers actually expanding the membrane. We just assumed that there was some force that the membrane expanded with. So that was just kind of a rough approximation, but our goal wasn't to look at the dynamics of the protrusion. Our goal was to look at what happens after the protrusion binds to one of those nodes. Okay. Did that answer your question, Yun Chang? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, Giancarlo, what's up? Did that, was that interesting? Yeah, okay. All right, so the question that, that I wanna ask today is I wanna say, how do we actually go about doing these simulations? Well, typically what we do is we write equations and solve them numerically. So by the way, if you have MATLAB on your computer, now would be a good time to open it up. Or if you have, you know, if you're using the online MATLAB, whatever you're using, now would be a good time to kind of get that set up. Uh, and while it's setting up, I'll talk for a little bit. So how many of you, there are uh, 11 of you here, how many of you have seen, how many of you have had numerical analysis? One, two. Okay, so only two of you, right? The rest of you have not. So, so this will be new to most of you. So. Please tell me 
if I'm going too fast or if you have a question. So how do we solve equations numerically? Right, so a lot of you are in like ODEs. I have Giancarlo and ODEs. You just write down solutions. You have an equation and you just solve it because you know how to do it. But most equations that you write down, you actually cannot write down the solution. And when you can write down the solution, we say you can solve it analytically. So most of the time you can't solve equations analytically and you have to solve them on a computer numerically. So the question is how you do that. And to do that, let's consider a quantity U of X. And I'm going to define X on zero L periodic. So this is a, we're going to say that X lives on a periodic domain. Here's L, here's zero. So does anybody know what, what does that mean? What does it mean for a domain to be periodic? Somebody just yell out, let's see. Um, I feel like I'm in class and I have to call on something. All right, Sam, what does it mean for a domain to be periodic? It like repeats itself. It repeats itself, right? So in particular, you can represent the whole space then by taking a copy of this. So let's actually do it. What it means is that if I make a copy of this guy, did it work? Paste, yes, it worked, okay? If I make a copy of this guy and I stick it over here, I can represent the whole space. So the domain kind of repeats itself over and over again, periodically. And the reason why periodic systems are common is because if you think about it, let's say you're trying to represent this huge box, right? Let's say you're trying to simulate this huge box, but you can't afford to simulate the huge box. So what you do is you cut out a little box and you simulate that. And then you assume, okay, this, the measurements in this little box are representative of the big box. I can just repeat the little box over and over again, periodically to obtain the big box. So in particular, as from a mathematical standpoint, what it means for a quantity to repeat, it means that any quantity defined at zero and L is the same. So U of zero equals U of L. So the value here and the value here have to be the same. And the reason is if I take that domain and I paste it on the other side, I better have the same value at the beginning point as at the end point. Because otherwise I'm gonna have two different values and it doesn't make sense which one I choose. And so now the question is how do we represent the function U of X? Well, one way we represent U of X is on a grid. So we take this domain, zero to L, and we discretize it. So we just, I had this Italian professor and she said discretize. She said it like with an Italian accent and it sounded really nice. So we, we discretize this domain. So we, we pick some points here. So I'll call this, this is X zero. x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, dot, dot, dot. We pick some points on the domain and we keep track of the values at those points. So I'll call it u of x1. I'll denote that by u1. etc. And so then if we wanna compute derivatives, We can approximate that just by looking at the neighboring values. So here's, 
Does anybody know what's an approximation if I want, let's say, the derivative u prime at x2? Can somebody tell me what's an approximation for that? You can do like a difference quotient. That's right. Okay. So uh, Giancarlo. Well, let me call on somebody else. Uh, maybe I shouldn't call on people because this isn't class. So, okay. Yeah. We got a couple. We got, okay. Yun Chang says this. So difference quotient is right. So when we think about this is we write down the definition of a derivative. So normally the definition of a derivative is the limit as h goes to zero of, let's say, u of x2 plus h minus u of x2 over h. So that's what everybody knows. That's the definition of derivative that you learn in calculus one. But now what I do is I say, OK, what if I take away the limit and I replace the equals with approximate? If h is small and I take an actual finite value of h, I should be able to approximate that derivative pretty well. So if h, let's say, is the distance between x3 and x4, this becomes u, I'm sorry, x2 and x3. This is u of x3 minus u of x2 over x3 minus x2. So this kind of method for calculating derivatives is called a finite difference method. And those are fairly common. They're very common. So all your big CFD codes out there, they run on these finite difference methods. That's what they do. So now, there's another way though. And the other way is to take advantage of the periodicity of the domain. So another way is to represent the function as an interpolant. So in the first way, we represent the function on the grid, values on the grid. In the second way, what we do is we approximate u of x as a sum of some basis functions. With these coefficients you have. And the idea with this is that we can actually evaluate you anywhere we want rather than just at the grid points because we know phi j of x. Those are going to be known basis functions. And the trick is, how do we find uj and how do we find it fast? So can anybody think of, we have, we're on a periodic domain. If we want to represent functions that are periodic, right, functions that repeat themselves over and over again, can somebody tell me what is an example of functions that repeat themselves over and over again? Okay, thank you. A lot, everybody says sine and cosine. Good. So what we're going to do is we're going to use sine of n pi x over L. So in particular, I'll say it this way, sine of n pi x over L and cosine of n pi x over L, where n is an integer from uh, 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 repeat themselves every L. So you can check that. Um, yeah. Did I do that right? 
I think I might have messed up the notation here. I think it might be two. Yeah, this should be two n pi x over l. Yeah, let's go. Let's just go with that. Okay. So because cosine and sine repeat themselves every two pi. So cosine and sine repeat themselves every two pi. That means that if I look at a domain on zero to L, if I take X equals L, here I'll have sine of two N pi times zero over L, which is sine of zero. And here I'll have sine of two N pi times L over L, which is sine of two N pi. And the sine of two pi times n is equal to sine of zero. So these are the same. Okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define wave numbers and I'm going to call them case of n and they're going to be equal to 2 n pi over L. Then I'm going to combine sine and cosine into a basis function. I'm going to take my basis functions phi n equals sine of kn x times i plus cosine of kn x. And then I'm gonna write u as a sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of u hat n e to the i kn x because this here is the same as e to the i kn x e to the i x is cosine x plus i sine x. So the reason why I'm doing this is because this is how MATLAB does it. And it's more convenient to work in this notation. So my other comment is, of course, we cannot do infinitely many modes. I didn't spell that right. right. The computer cannot add up from minus infinity to infinity. So what we do is we take a large number n and cut the sum there. So I will assume that n is even. I'm gonna cut the sum at u of x equals the sum from n equals negative n over two to n over two minus one of u hat n e to the i k n x. And this here is how we're gonna represent our function u. So I realized that I went through that kind of fast. Are there any questions? Please ask questions if I confused you.
No questions? All right. Have people seen this stuff before or is this totally new? New, okay. Giancarlo, did you did you follow that or not? It's okay to say not, not at all or not really. Yeah, I followed. You did? Okay, good. I knew you would. Okay, Miata says new. Okay, Miata, so how, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. What, was that okay with the pace? Do you want me to explain something again or? I think I'll reread my notes and then maybe, can I email you questions? Yeah, absolutely. You're all welcome to email me questions. This is for fun, so. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, oh, I should turn the iPad, right? So I, one of my students always asks me to turn the iPad and I always forget. So the point is we're representing this function U in on a computer by these coefficients u hat of n. And the question is, how do we get those coefficients? Well, what we do is we take a grid. So here's a grid. By the way, this is definitely 2n pi over l. I had a typo in my notes, but thank God not in my code. So I don't have to redo the code on the fly. <laughs> Okay, so now we have this domain zero to L. And one way we figure out these coefficients u hat n is we put n points on the domain. And so for each, I'm going to call each of these points xj. For each j, we know u of xj, let's say, initially. And so then what we do is we write down our equation, e to the i k n xj. And what you have is you have this equation holding for each j equals 1 dot 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 n. And what that means is, it means that you wind up with a system of n equations in n unknown coefficients you had n. So what you're doing is you have the values of the function. You just need to figure out what are the coefficients of the basis functions that at every point gives me the correct answer. Okay. So this operation, and this is why I wrote it using complex notation, because normally if you have n equations in n unknown coefficients, you have to solve an n by n linear system. But there's a way where you don't actually have to like write a matrix and solve it because MATLAB, people do this operation so much going from values to coefficients that MATLAB and people have worked on it really hard and they have a special algorithm for it called the fast Fourier transform. Or the FFT. And the FFT will take you from values on the grid to the coefficients. And today what we're going to do is we're going to practice with the FFT. So if you all have MATLAB open, we'll just, we're going to do a little FFT action right after I get through this next example. So 
So here's an example. So why is this useful? Okay. Going back to what I talked about before, I started by talking about finite differences, computing derivatives. Well, here, how can we use the representation to compute a derivative? So let me ask you just straight up, if this is u of x, what's u prime of x? Those of you who I, who I don't call on, feel free to blurt out. I'm just calling on people that I know because I feel awkward calling on people who I don't know. So Giancarlo, can you tell me what's the derivative of this function? Where do you see an x and how do you take a derivative of that? Like x in the equation? Yeah, so u of x equals, where's the x? It's in the exponential here. Yeah. So how do you take the derivative of an exponential? It's the, you keep the same and take the derivative of the function i k n x, which is going to right. be i k n times e to the i k n x. So what you see is that in the derivative, all that happens is you multiply by i k. So the simple way to compute a derivative is you compute u hat from u, and then what you do is multiply by i k n, and then convert back to get u prime. So that's what we're gonna do right now. All right, let's get to it. So I want you to open up MATLAB, and while you do that, I just want to check my book to make sure I don't mess up. All right. Um, stop the share. Okay, so now I'm I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little coding, but I I want you to to code along with me, okay? Because it's just more fun that way. Because if you don't do it now, you won't do it. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want us to start by looking at a function. All right, so what I want us to do first is let's pick a length of the domain. So let's say that the domain has length one, and let's pick a number of grid points on the domain. So let's say that we have 32 grid points. So 
So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make the values X. And how we do that is we, first of all, we set the width of the spacing between the X's. And what that is, is if you want N points on a domain of size L uniformly spaced, we need a, an H of L divided by N. So H is the spacing between X's. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do H, I'm gonna do X equals zero to N minus one times H. So the reason I'm doing this, if you look at what I actually get for X, is I start at zero and I just go by equally spaced. Well, can I plot it? Let's plot it. Can you see the figure? No. No. Okay, I have to share my desktop. Then. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So what you see is I have equally spaced points on the x-axis, but I'm missing the point at L. And the reason I'm missing that point is because I have zero. And because this is a periodic domain, zero and L are the same thing. So that's our nodes X. And then I wanted you to define a function U on that domain. And I, I want you to do, just do something like this, do two pi X times sine of four pi X. It's important you put this dot star here because that will, MATLAB will multiply things correctly if you do that. And then what, I'm, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna, we know the derivative, so we're gonna have the exact derivative, and then we're gonna check it against what we get from our Fourier uh, expansion, from our uh, wave number expansion that I just talked about, the basis function technique. So here is, what the function looks like, right? It looks like a nice, it's a periodic function for sure because it comes up here and repeats itself. But it's not really trivial, right? It looks kind of difficult to, to take the derivative of that. And we're gonna see how the Fourier method does. So are people with me? Are you with me? Are you, are you coding along with me? All right. Can I go on or not yet? Uh, not yet then, should I wait? All right, so, and, and run, and just run this file, make sure you don't get any errors. If you do get an error, you might have forgotten the dot star. That's really important to put that dot star in there. It tells MATLAB not to multiply arrays as matrices, but to multiply them element-wise. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to extract the Fourier, the uh, Fourier, periodic basis function coefficients of u. And in order to do that, we need to define the wave numbers k. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll show you what I mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the FFT to extract the coefficients of u. That's what I talked about. We're going to solve that system to obtain u hat sub n. That's the FFT, fast Fourier transform. But now when I take the derivative, I have to multiply by i times k. So in order to do that, I define these wave numbers here. And they're exactly what I wrote down, but they're in a different order. So MATLAB does not, remember we said that k sub n was 2 pi, little, 2 pi n over L. So what this is, is it's 2 pi over L, and then I multiply it by integers. But MATLAB, they order the wave numbers funny. MATLAB always starts when you take the FFT, the first thing you get is the zero wave number. So the first element in your array is the zero wave number. And then you count up until you get to n over two minus one. And then you start again at minus n over two and you go to negative one. So this is just an array. Like if I actually print this out, what it is, you see that it's just an array. It goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 15, and then it goes to negative 16, all the way back to negative 1. So that's all it is. And then I multiply those integers by 2 pi over L. So now, if I want the derivative, what I do is I multiply by 1i times k. Multiply by u hat. And this step here is, is really not necessary, but the reason why I do this step is because this wave number here is unpaired. So it, remember when we're in complex, when we're doing complex wave numbers, we have, we have to have pairs so that we get real valued answers. So if you look at this array of the wave numbers, all of the positive numbers should have a match as in a negative number, but negative 16 doesn't have a match. So I set the derivative of that value to zero. And then what I do is I go from the u hats, which I now multiplied by one i times k back to real space. I take the inverse fast Fourier transform to get the derivative in real space. And then I compare that to the actual answer. So if you've had if you have time, if you had had time to code that up, run it for me and tell me what you get for the error. Okay, uh, Bao Yi, I hope I said that right. Bao Yi got 2.6983 times 10 to the negative 12. I got something times 10 to the negative 14. It doesn't matter. The point is the error is really small. In fact, it's so small, it's actually the smallest number a computer can represent, which is something like 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15. Okay, so the conclusion of this is you have a really good approximation to the derivative using 32 modes. And so then the question is, what if I do 16? Still really good. How about eight? Also really good. What about four, four modes? Okay, big error. So four is not enough modes. How about six? Still big error. Four is not enough. So six is not enough. So eight is the minimum number. So we need eight modes to represent the solution, but notice that once we get to those eight modes, we get an error of zero. Fantastic. We have represented the function exactly on the grid and we took the derivative almost exactly. 
So now the, the question I want to ask you is, let's compare that to the finite difference approach. So remember, in the finite difference way, what we do is we take u, so u, so I'm going to call this u prime finite difference. We take u and we subtract from it u at the value before that to get the derivative. So in MATLAB, you can code that up just by doing what's called circ shift of u minus 1. And if you do the, that circular shift, what it does is it shifts everything in the array over. So for example, if I look at u, there's u, and then if I circ shift u minus 1, this guy went over here. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah. This guy went this way. This guy went this way. This guy went this way. So we're shifting. But what we want to do is we want to get the, the, we actually want u minus the value before it. So we're going to do a circular shift by one. So now the value that was before zero now gets shifted to the zero position. And then what we do is, because we're doing a finite difference, we divide it by h. Because that's like the value in the derivative, h. And let's run that. So somebody tell me when you run that, what do you get for the error for u prime using a finite difference method? Just run this line here and tell me what you get. Or, you know, run the whole thing. Oh, you want to, sorry, you have to code the error. So the error, the finite difference error is the max, same thing, max abs of u prime finite difference minus the real value u prime. So somebody run that and tell me, what did you get for the error? Did I make a typo? Somebody tell me. Did you run it? It's okay if it's a big number. Yes, 18, right? I got I got 10. But you might have a different n. You're getting a huge number. And now the question is: how how much do I have to jack up n? to get the number down. So let's say we do 100 points. Okay, we did better, 0 0.9. Let's go to 1,000 points, 0.09. 10,000 points, now we're at 0 0.009, that's pretty small. But with the spectral method, all we needed was eight modes and we were able to get the derivative. And the finite difference method, we need thousands of points. So the let, I'm going to stop here, and what we learned today is basically, you know, first we talked about how these biological systems work, and we have to solve equations numerically. And then I showed you how do we solve things numerically. Well, if, if functions are smooth and periodic, the spectral method is absolutely the way to go, the Fourier method, the interpolate method. So you represent the function in terms of sines and cosines, and you do all your operations on those coefficients. And that's when we solve the Stokes equations, that's how we're going to do it.
we're going to do all the operations on the coefficients and then go back to real space at the end. Okay, so I'm going to stop and please ask some questions or let me know how I did. If it was too, too slow, too fast, please tell me so I can change it for next time. Did people learn something? Zian, you actually learned something? What did you learn? Um, I, I, lear I learned a little bit more about the physiology of the, the cell. Okay, good. So some of you, coding was a little fast for me. Okay. So um, I, think, I think what I can do is I can send this file uh, out to you guys and you can play with it if you want. Um, I'll just send it to Chella and she'll send it out to you guys. Okay. Uh, certainly. I'll, I'll definitely uh, email you guys that file from Andre. All right. Anybody, uh, any questions? Please ask. Giancarlo, how was it? It was good. I liked it. Okay. Can you repeat again if, like, if it's smooth and periodic? Periodic. Yeah. Like, yeah. Was again. What is it? What? Used for? Like, what do you use if it's smooth? You use the spectral method, the Fourier okay. method. Right, so if you have a function which is just very smooth and, and periodic, representing it in terms of sines and cosines is the way to go because sines and cosines are smooth and sines and cosines are periodic. But now if you have a periodic function that looks like this, a sharp peak on it like a hat, a pointy hat, that's a bad idea to represent with, for, with sines and cosines because sines and cosines are gonna have a really hard time resolving the bump in the hat. So for that, it's actually better to use a finite difference method. The reason why I did spectral today is because when we do fluid solves, usually the stuff we're dealing with is smooth. And in my research, the stuff I deal with is smooth. And so I, use, I only use spectral methods. I've done now a bunch of projects and I've only used spectral methods pretty much. Um, I really enjoy the course. I just have a quick question. So in numerical analysis, we learned the polynomial um, method yeah. to interpolate things. So um, could you comment on what's the difference between that and the uh, uh, spectral method? Yeah. yeah, you see, so, so did you learn about Chebyshev polynomials? Yeah. So Chebyshev polynomials are the counterpart to sines and cosines on finite non-periodic domains. So if you have a domain which runs from zero to one and is not periodic, you cannot use sines and cosines. Right. So you have to use something else. And it turns out that the Chebyshev basis is the way to go. It represents the, the sides really well like it, it refines near the boundaries and in the middle it's very coarse. And that basis turns out to be, to have a good uh, rate of decay when it represents functions on finite domains. But for periodic domains, sines and cosines are the way to go. Cool. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Any, uh, what other questions do you have? Um, I'm wondering, can you explain a little bit more about how the FFT works? Yes. So the FFT, normally when you have to invert that matrix for the coefficients, it, it costs you n squared flops. 
because, because of, uh, it's just a matrix inversion. But the way the FFT works is the FFT kind of divides, they use properties of the Fourier exponents and they divide up the modes in such a way that you get order n log n time. So basically here's how you do the FFT. Okay, let's say you have 32 modes to start. Normally you'd have to do a 32 by 32 system, but you can collapse the system down into com by combining modes into 16 and then eight and then four, two, one. Then you solve a one by one or a two by two system. I don't remember what it is. And then you go back up. Then you have an algebraic relationship that gives you from one coefficient to two, four, eight, 16, 32. So the, the idea is that the algebraic operations cost you n flops at each stage. And when you're dividing by two over and over again, that's log n times. So the total cost is n times log n. Now, I'm sorry that I don't have a more precise explanation of how that, that collapsing and expanding works but you can look it up. Uh, it, it, it deals with properties of exponents. And actually Gauss was the one who discovered that. Got you, thank you. What are your other questions? Okay, I, I guess if there's no other questions, then I'll, I'll stop and turn it back to Chella. Uh, well, thank you so much, Andre. Uh, it was a really wonderful session. Uh, I just wanna make a quick announcement uh, for the next session. It's going to be on Wednesday, uh, March 3rd, uh, at the same time, 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I do also wanna attach a couple of links in the chat um, for you guys to look at. If you have not signed up for uh, Siam yet, uh, please do. Uh, you'll be on our mailing list and you'll find out about uh, lots of events just like this one. Um, and I've also included our NYU Siam website that we uh, just got up. Um, and so this recording will be posted on our NYU Siam YouTube channel, um, which I'm going to link uh, over here. And uh, Andre, if you wouldn't mind, could you send your email in the chat? Because I know someone was asking about uh, contacting you uh, later with some questions. You're welcome to email me if you want to ask about what I talked about today or if you have any other questions. Feel free to use me as a kind of grad student mentor. If you want. Uh, well, wonderful. Uh, thank you again, Andre. Uh, and we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Andre. Okay, bye everybody. See you next